Good morning. Uh, this is a, I'm Curtis Backstrom, I'm an optometrist in Washington State in the United States of America, and I am just giving you a uh, heads up on what we're going to be working on today. Today we're going to be taking a look at uh, neuro optometric rehabilitation in regards to several tests that you can use in regards to um, patients who have suffered brain injury. Now, why are we as optometrists involved with this? Well, what happens is that visual components are very much a big part of, of traumatic brain injuries and concussions. So what we're gonna talk about today is dynamic visual vestibular testing for concussion and minimal traumatic brain injury. Now concussions and minimal traumatic brain injuries are more recognized around the globe. They are found now in a more higher percentage of our patients. And one of the problems is, is that many of these patients, of course, are not even, even recognized. Also, vision is recognized as a major component in the rehabilitation process. In fact, in many situations, vision is a missing link for a lot of these patients because the patient has been in therapy for a long period of time, not made success, and then found that vision was a critical component that needed to be addressed so that they could work and become rec recovered from their conditions. So how do we as vision care providers provide a better evaluation? Um, first of all, what is a concussion? It's defined as an immediate acceleration or deceleration or stopping event resulting in temporary or permanent damage to the structures of and within the head. So really a injury can occur just by bumping your head where you now have damage either to a localized area or to a lung pathway. Two and a half million brain injuries were reported in 2010 here in the States. These are hospital visits. Well, what's interesting is that the, the thought is that this is probably five to six times greater if you include all head injuries because very few of them are actually reported and brought into the hospitals. 5% of these were concussion type injuries. Now really the big question again is how many are not reported? In fact, one of 10 of these patients also have what's considered persistent symptoms. That means following a head injury, they still have symptoms for two weeks afterwards. So one of the primary symptoms is dizziness, which is usually considered a vestibular issue, but we'll show you today that you cannot separate visual and vestibular input and that anytime you have a vestibular issue, it is related to vision. And also, if you have symptoms of a, in a patient that's more than two weeks out, we strongly recommend a comprehensive visual evaluation. Now, there's six subtypes of concussion. This comes from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, which are columns, both of them are involved. <clears throat> Note that the first three are vestibular, visual, and cervical. Those make up the VVC triad. Again, anytime we're talking about visual processing, vestibular inner ear, and cervical, those three are all very linked. In addition, there is anxiety, migraine headaches, and cognition and processing speed. As you can imagine, if you have a visual condition, that may also affect these three areas too. So in reality, vision does have an impact on all six subtypes of concussion. So what do we need to assess? First of all, of course, we need to check ocular health. And then we're gonna take a look at your basic refraction and visual acuities. But then when we take a look at visual acquisition skills, those are skills of me using my accommodation, my binocular vision, and also my ocular motor skills to be able to go out and get information about my environment so that I can now guide my action upon. Lastly, we're not gonna discuss this, but visual information processing skills, my visual memory, visual discrimination, those types of skills are also important. But what we're gonna to touch on today is some just briefly about visual vestibular processing for image stabilization and balance and mobility. We often don't think of uh, vision as being image stabilizers, but vision is very critical of that with the vestibular system. And also commonly as optometrists, we don't think too much about balance because most patients can get by, but patients are at a higher fall risk following a brain injury. Now, in regards to concussions and vestibular processing, there's two main systems you wanna be paying attention to. 
the peripheral vestibular system, which includes the apparatus in the vestibular system. This includes semicircular canals. Semicircular canals are rotational input. So if I'm rotating my head, that's important. Also otolithic. Otolithic is about linear acceleration. That is linear stimulation forward and backward. If you take a look at linear acceleration with the otolith, this is also involved in things like skew deviation where the patient may not have symptoms in a prone position, and is rather a supine position. Secondly, we want to take a look at the central vestibular system. Now that's how the visual information comes in, the vestibular information comes in, and we integrate those two to make sure we have a match. That integrates ocular motor control with vestibular input. We're gonna be talking a lot about uh, the vestibular ocular reflex gain, the VOR gain. And what that basically is, is the central processing of while I'm moving my head, can I keep images and everything clear? So my visual system motion processing is here, my vestibular head rotation system is, and what happens is, is that when I'm rotating my head, those images and the processing of the motion and the head should be synchronized so everything is clear. When you have a VOR gain problem, then what happens is you turn your head, the two are not synchronized smoothly together, and you'll get uh, motion, or you're gonna get dizziness and disequilibrium. Now the sensors, again, otoliths have to do with linear stimulation, near far, semicircular canals, rotational. What's interesting is if you take a look at the semicircular canals and you place them into the orbits and show them, they're actually in the same plane of regard as the extraocular muscles. Now what a beautiful thing. It would make sense that if these two systems have to synchronize, that they relatively have to be in the same planes. Now let's just take a look here at the semicircular canals, input to extraocular muscles, and this is some of the work. You can take a look at this at Eye Movement Disorders uh, by Agnes Wong. These are some of the diagrams from her. But if you note here, when you rotate the head to the right, you get stimulation of the medial rectus and lateral rectus of one eye and the inhibition of the other two. So again, if I'm fixating on you, I rotate my head to the left, I have stimulation of these two recti and inhibition of these two. So again, a direct relationship of the vestibular system to the extraocular muscles. Another way you can think about this is the vestibular system is a subcortical mechanism. And then we use cortical functioning, such as pursuits, saccades, and OKN, to override that system and make it more efficient. The last component of that, though, is the cerebellum. The cerebellum helps to modulate those signals. Here is a diagram of the otoliths. You take a look at the otoliths. The nice thing about this pair is that the otoliths are actually connected to all extractor muscles at once. It has to deal with, again, linear input or, or head tilt. The semicircular canals, taking a step back, semicircular canals are pairs of muscles. So the horizontal semicircular canals are related to the horizontal recti muscles. But again, in the otoliths, it's different where all six extraocular muscles are wired to the otoliths. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the VOR gain. Again, the VOR gain is, needs to be 1.0 so that when I'm moving my head back and forth, both of them must be in the same place it allows them to be integrated and seen as sharp and clear with head movement. Now again, this includes subcortical and cortical components. So the VOR, vestibular ocular reflex, includes the OKN, pursuits, saccades, and fixation. Let's just take a look at an infant for a second. An infant's visual system, pursuits and saccades, are not fully developed. So the VOR early on is primarily more subcortical, but as that infant develops, pursuits and saccades, that overrides that system and allows you to get a gain of 1.0. Also, remember that when these patients are having difficulty, when they're looking from one place to another, if I'm looking from right to left space, I get motion the opposite way. Many of these patients are very sensitive to the motion, and what happens is that if they blink, that stops the motion buildup, and a fixation then allows you to override it and dampen it. So one of the things is many of these head trauma patients stop blinking, they're in a continuous stare, so all motion signals continue to build up. And again, visual motion sensitivity, it can be occurring during two different types of conditions. One is, let's say I'm a patient, a 
person in a car looking straight ahead at the license plate in front of me. As I'm going, I have motion going past me, which is considered optic flow. The other thing is that when I'm making a saccade from point A to point B in my visual world, I will have motion from the, of the fixation going from point A to point B. So a saccade will produce motion as well. So as you can see, visual motion sensitivity can be caused by several different types of movement. Now, dynamic visual vestibular testing, what we want to take a look at is you do your standard refraction and visual acuity testing. That is static testing. But your patients with head injury have difficulty with motion. So what happens is we want to take a look at what can you do in your regular standard exam to add dynamic testing to. So to truly assess, again, a head injury, we want to look at dynamic testing. So dynamic visual vestibular testing should include the VOR gain evaluation, but also includes some visual motion sensitivity testing. So there's three tests that we use primarily in our clinics to go and evaluate these patients. They're very simple, very quick. And number one is called the dynamic visual acuity test. This has been researched and published in the literature. It's used to assess the VOR gain, which again is if I move my head, can the imagery, both the head motion and uh, visual motion, are they stable together? Number two is distant saccades, which means I'm looking from point A to point B, far away. C is OKN testing, which is a rotating drum, looking at motion off to the side. Now let's talk about how we use each one, dynamic visual acuity testing. What happens is the patient is refracted and they're given their complete prescription, hopefully in a trial frame. You do, cannot really do this in a phropter very well, so you go ahead and trial frame it or use the patient's uh, habitual prescription. You check the visual acuity, let's say it's 20-20. We have the patient tip their head down to about 20-30 degrees because the canal actually is rotated up, so it's down in the horizontal, and rotate the head right and left. Two cycles per second, 1001, 1002, about that speed. And if you have a drop in visual acuity of two lines, that's significant, suggesting there is a vestibular issue with the VOR gain. Be careful of patients that are over 40 that are presbyopic. If they have a progressive lens and they move their head side to side, they may be looking through the edges of the progressive. So again, tilt the head down, looking over the progressive, and rotate the head. The head thrust test uh, and also head shaking the segments test, we do not use those because they're not really quantitative, but the dynamic visual acuity test allows me to assess a change in prescription or other tools to be able to improve it, so that's why we use primarily just the dynamic visual acuity test. The distance saccade test is asking the patient to look in primary gaze and alternately look at right and left sides of your room. Have the patient sitting in their exam chair, look to the left, look to the right, look to the left, look to the right. Now you notice that it was I producing any head movement. If the patient is just moving their eyes only, that would be considered visual motion. If the patient's doing this though, back and forth, what happens is now you've got vestibular, cervical, and visual information. So if they're getting symptoms with that, which we're scaling from zero to 10, so we're comparing their baseline sitting compared to what's going on during the head movement, not when they stop, but during the head movement. If their symptoms go from zero to five, that suggests there is a concern there. But you want to evaluate if the patient's doing this and they're getting a five, you'd think, oh, the saccade test suggests, suggests this visual motion. We ask the patient now to stop moving their head and just use their eyes only. If they now have still have symptoms, you're thinking it's probably visual motion. But if they stop moving their head and just use their eyes, and there is no symptoms, then you're thinking that means that it was a vestibular issue. So you can rule out vestibular versus visual motion with this type of test too. We may modify behaviors and probe with lenses or other tools. The one thing we haven't talked too much about yet is the use of lenses. A low amount of plus lens increases magnification and magnification actually increases the VOR gain. So if the patient has had a head injury and the VOR gain is less than one, and the patient moves their head and things start becoming blurry, that means the VOR gain is low. So if we add plus 50 over 
plane of habitual, or let's say they refract at minus two, you put minus 150 on them and they move their head, we're gonna expect their visual acuity to improve and not be blurry. Again, this is because of magnification, and the magnification increases the VOR gain. So it matches what should be done in real life. Again, we're gonna evaluate visual, vestibular, and cervical components with number one lenses. We primarily use low plus for these patients. You may use base in prism, or possibly if it's a diplopia case, binocular prism. You may also use what's called binasal occlusion, which is blocking here, and we uh, don't have time to cover that today, but that's another component, and also tints and filters as well. OKN visual motion sensitivity. Patient looks towards the eye chart and the OKN drum is off to the side, spinning. Again, we wanna go as slow as possible. If you go fast, it's gonna be blur and you're not gonna pick up any motion to the side. So it's a very slow rotation, slow as you can go, and we also change rotational direction too. Observe and see if the patient's sensitive to that. Scaling it again, zero to 10. Again, trial low plus, colored filters, low base in, binasal. So we're always gonna look for what are the things we can do to change function as far as that motion. So optometric considerations for treatment. Typically, we're gonna ask the patient to work on visual hygiene, substitution strategies. So one of the primary things is blinking. Many of these patients are what we call deer with the headlights where if a deer gets headlights in their eyes, they just stare. And again, what happens is any motion that's in front of them will continue to build up and give them symptoms. A blink will stop the motion and reset with fixation and dampen the signal. Number two, lenses. Again, plus increases magnification, increasing VOR gain. Prism, binocular, and postural considerations. We can look at binocular prism, also posture, tints and filters. Uh, and also vision therapy or rehabilitation. So for probes, this example number one, the patient has an OK drum off to the side. She has uh, basically no refraction. We trial frame plus 50 over the top, repeat the drum, and now she says there's no discomfort at all. Patient two here, uh, we use blue, orange, and yellow tints. Again, we don't have time to discuss all the intricacies of why they're beneficial but it changes the central peripheral relationships of color and such. So what happens is a lot of times the motion will be decreased with glasses as well. A lot of times we'll find that they do better with color versus a neutral density, which would just cut down the symptoms. <clears throat> now testing on the OCAN, one other thing to remember is with OCAN motion testing, patients generally will do follow instructions appropriately, looking straight ahead and the drum is to the side, the instructional set is to look straight ahead. However, once well in the patient to the right here, you'll see the patient looking at the drum. We're trying to look for optic flow off to the sides, not central motion. So again, you're testing motion two different ways. A saccade gives you horizontal motion during a eye movement. And then this one, the patient has fixation and peripheral motion is in the periphery. So again, those are two different kinds of motion sensitivity issues that we want to address. So case presentation, here's a concussion patient three years ago. Two times they've gone through vestibular rehabilitation and no improvement in gaze stabilization therapy. The patient reports their symptoms have not improved. We, the patient's com chief complaint is reporting of blur with head movement and riding in a car. Also had some associated headaches with that blur. We refracted the patient, Plano 20-20 in each eye. We go ahead and do the dynamic visual acuity test, shaking the head two rotations here. 2050 visual acuity, a loss of more than two lines of visual acuity, indicative of a visual vestibular dysfunction in the VR gain. But we also checked distance saccades. The symptoms were two and went to five. On the OKN drum to the sides, went from two to five. We trial framed a plus 50 over the top. Patient's distance visual acuity now 2020 with blur means they're not quite perfect, but they're much better than they were. Saccades actually improve from baseline, the motion, and also motion from the OCAN improve from baseline. So overview, concussion, minimal traumatic brain injury includes both visual and vestibular components. Very commonly, you're gonna hear that a VOR gain is a vestibular disorder. However, no, it is a visual vestibular disorder, and optometrists should be critically involved upfront with these patients 
and working with them. So we always look at it in our hospital setting, the, the optometrist, if there's anything found by our occupational therapist or physiotherapist on vestibular issues, we always strongly recommend that we have a visual examination to rule out ocular health issues, and then to take a look at functionally what we can do with lenses, prisms, and other tools in our toolbox. So three brief tests again, dynamic visual acuity test, distance saccades, OCAN. Three tests probably takes two to three minutes to run them all, just a, just a little bit to be able to find out from this patient exactly what's going on. Remember, small change in prescription may not really change visual acuity much. However, the magnification is really the key in regards to improving the VOR gain and reducing visual motion sensitivity. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention to this really critical program in regards to looking at optometrists and vision care providers and how we can go ahead and help these patients with uh, concussions and minimal traumatic brain injuries. Thank you and hopefully you have a good rest of the meeting.